Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Can't hear you. Good morning. 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 Thank you. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, and then we'll start just at verse 1. It says, uh, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, uh, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all um, godliness and honesty. For this is accept is, excuse me, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, uh, our Savior, who will have the, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. You can go on further down than that. Um, then he's going to start giving um, uh, praise about Jesus. But this is written to Timothy, and I'm just going to use this as an introduction uh, for the topic of which we're going to be discussing for the next five weeks, which is prayer. So this in particular was commanded to Timothy and what would be considered uh, not just a prison epistle, but a pastoral epistle, which this is Paul writing to Timothy, encouraging him on uh, a number of areas, but in particular with regard to his, I guess, responsibility or his duty or his office as the fact that he is a pastor. But now this isn't restricted to just him, and it isn't restricted just to males, and it isn't restricted to just the fact of, okay, if you're in pastoral authority that you're the person that's supposed to be praying and then supplicating and giving him thanks because we're actually told that in Philippians 4 but there's a promise associated with that when you do that with regard to Philippians 4 but he commands here even though it's exhortations basically it's a command it's imperative that we should pray and it particularly says that for those that are kings, for those that are in authority, and uh, that it should be made for all men. Okay, so in other words, God's desire, God's design uh, is that everyone should be prayed for. And in particular, for those that are kings and those that are authority, uh, that we would lead quiet and peaceful lives. So that we would have uh, obstacles removed or restrictions taken out for us to be able to go ahead and follow and live out God's will without opposition. Even though we know that there is opposition <laughs> from the world and there is going to be opposition from, you know, obviously from our flesh and from the devil. Um, so, that begs the question, if we are commanded to pray, then what, I mean, I know this seems kind of silly, but like, what is it, what is prayer then? I'm commanded to do it, but what is it? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Asking things for God. Okay. Now, how did you arrive at that conclusion? Um, how did I arrive? I, I guess that's what I wanted to speak. Okay. I read a book years ago. Anybody else have any other? Just talking to God. Talking to God. Communicating. Okay. How did you arrive at that? I'm not trying to put you on a spot or being. I'm just trying. It's fellowship. I mean, just like talking to you. It's talking to God. How? Who? Like, in other words, how did you learn that? How did you? Who taught you that? Or how did you? How did you arrive at that conclusion that that's... Well, it's, I'm not questioning your... I like the, the Our Father. It's, talk, it's like, you know, talking to God, praising God. And okay. Does anybody have any other answers? Anybody else? 
right. <laughs> so that's here where we kind of kind of learn. Um, there are seven particular Hebrew Aramaic words that are used in the Old Testament as far as for pray or prayer. And then we have let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then we have eleven um, in Greek that are listed as just for, for pray. Um, I'll go, well, <laughs> I could read them off to you, but the, with the exception of three of them, they all have the same idea, the same connotation, the same definition, which is asking. It's literally to ask. Now, it's used interchangeably at times with supplication, which is basically like a strong urging or, or begging, uh, and then it can also be used interchangeably at times in certain passages where uh, intercession is made. An intercession is basically you're coming on the behalf of somebody, but literally just the word pray would be to ask. Uh, though there are multiple words that are used, the uh, definition sum up basically that it's to ask. It's just you're making a request, you're asking. Uh, now the actual act itself of prayer, we'll look at when we analyze a uh, number of different prayers that we see in the Bible. Um, in particular, we'll see Daniel's. Uh, we'll see Jesus' prayer himself when he prayed, not only just when he told the disciples um, as far as this is how you are to pray, but also we'll look at his prayer in um, John 17. <coughs> and we'll look at a few others, actually. Um, prayer Jabez will have also, um, which is interesting, Ahaz's prayer, that God actually responded and answered his prayer, despite the fact that at the time he was actually under judgment. What about Jabez's prayer? Well, we'll look at that. But <laughs> but because it, it does fall under something that was prayed. And then you would look and see the elements of the pattern that actually, most of them actually kind of follow the pattern that actually Jesus gave in Matthew and in Luke. Um, but the word itself just means to ask. Um, so, I'm sorry, we are in Second Timothy, or excuse me, First Timothy chapter two. Uh, First Timothy chapter two. For those that are coming in, uh, we're looking at the subject of prayer. We're uh, starting a, a series on prayer, and just we're analyzing what it is. Um, and then uh, we looked at uh, verses one through four, and what we're at right now is that. Paul was telling Timothy that he exhorts all men, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Uh, and then that begged the question that, well, if we're asked to do something, which is to pray specifically here, uh, well, he asked Timothy to do that, but by extension, it's us that are being commanded here to pray. And if we're commanded to do so, then we ought to know, okay, what it is, and not only what it is, but how to go about doing it. So. Prayer itself is just simply asking. It's making requests. Um, now there are elements and aspects to it, uh, but prayer itself is just uh, making requests. John R. Rice wrote a uh, pretty extensive book on it um, called Prayer and Asking and Receiving. And, I mean, there's other people that have written books on prayer itself, but um, I would recommend reading it. The only thing is that some of his assertions he doesn't actually have. Um, I don't know what this. <laughs> he doesn't have like the spiritual backing in the content of it. What I mean by that is, <laughs> I guess what I'm expecting was um, he communicates the thought and he communicates the principle. But in other words, like I was expecting when you would read, he puts forth an assertion. And then you would have like, okay, footnoted, or maybe within the within the page, okay, here are the verses where you would have got that from. But you can you can you can easily pick it up if you read it. But that that's I guess I was expecting okay like an outline laid out. Of, okay, boom, this is how I write that the conclusion. This is how I write that this conclusion. This is how I write that conclusion. Um, but it's still it, nonetheless it's still pretty um, pretty much the most thorough work as far as 
um, what prayer actually is uh, that you can get. Now, uh, a little bit of what I'm going to say here is founded on some of that, and that is that though in prayer there are elements of what would be considered worship and supplication and uh, interceding, those are, if you want to get technical about it, those are all separate and individual elements, and they're different and distinct from prayer. Prayer itself is actually just asking. So you can uh, worship God in prayer, and that is, uh, I hope I'm not getting confusing here, is that worship itself is just your, I guess, admiring God or adoring God. Literally, worship, the actual word itself just means to prostrate yourself. So it's like you're just laying down flat on your face before God. And what you're doing is you're basically acknowledging who He is. There might be an element of that in your prayer, but the prayer itself, a prayer technically really is just a request that you're making of God. Um, so, when we are to pray, it should be that we come before God, yes, and then there, he gives a prescription with regard to that in Matthew 6, which we're getting ready to look at, if you turn there. Um, but prayer itself is just the actual request, the asking, the asking. The asking. Matthew 6. Six, and you'll be starting at verse 5. Matthew 6, and we'll be at verse 5. It says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, um, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou, how, excuse me, when thou hast shut the door, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Uh, but when we, excuse me, but when we, when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive us, or excuse me, as we forgive our debtors. And then lead us not into temptation and deliver us, excuse me, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Alright, so that's his prescription, and then here's what we're getting ready to analyze. Um, this would be in the course of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this was Jesus communicating to his disciples basically what discipleship is. Uh, so when he arrives to this portion, um, he's addressing certain things. Previous, at the beginning, at the beginning of chapter six, he, takes, he talks about um, that don't be as uh, <laughs> that you would do your alms before men, as the uh, Pharisees do, and as the the hypocrites do, which they love to be seen of men for their almsgiving. And then he addresses all the fact here that they, when they pray, they like to do so in a public manner, in a public fashion for the attention. Um, so his prescription here is one, hypocritical prayer is prohibited. You see that in verse 5, it says, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites. Um, now, here's the reasons why he gives as to why not to do so. One, it robs God of their glory, or excuse me, robs God of His glory, and that is, they do so so that they could be seen of men, and then it robs you of your reward. Uh, and then he says, verily, they have their reward. Now, I, I know this game sounds kind of silly, but when you pray, why do you pray? What's the reason? Can we save the answer? 
to get God to do things. Okay. Now, why would that be the case? I don't know, that seems silly, but like. Because we need, we need God to do things. And we're yeah. commanded to pray. Yes. Okay. Well, well, yes, we are commanded. But we need God. Yep, go ahead. Uh, prayer for thank you for what he's done. That's not prayer, though. Why not? Because prayer is asking. The definition of the word is, I tell you, I ask, I, I, I request. So, that, well, yeah, that would you be could a praise yeah. God, you could worship God by thanking him, but that's not prayer. Technicality. <laughs> well, he's asking about prayer, though. Okay. The, the okay. problem is people don't understand what prayer is. So, you know, if you don't know what the word means, then a lot of times people talk to God, but talking to God isn't asking God. Okay. And there's a difference. What I, yeah, basically what I wanted to get at was the fact that when we ask, it's because we need something. Okay? And we need it because we're needy. One. Go ahead. Well, we need to pray for other people on their needs. Yes, actually. Um, since you guys are coming in, First Timothy chapter 2 is where we started off. But we're actually at Matthew. Well, yeah, you guys are Matthew chapter 6. So you heard that. We're in Matthew chapter 6 right now. Um, we, yeah, we are commanded. We are actually specifically commanded to. Um, but the reason why we would do so is because it, it's needful for us. God doesn't really need us to pray, does he? No. no. We need it. Okay, so we're needful. We're needy. Two, even if, even if we had the, the ability to be able to do some of the things that we are requesting of God, um, the fact is, it goes counter, and we're going to we'll look at this in Hebrews. Um, but it goes counter his purpose or design for us. And that goes back to Genesis where we are created for his glory. Not just for his pleasure, but we are created to glorify him. Right? And literally glorifying God is to demonstrate who he is. Now we are marring that because of sin. Um, and a lot of times we yield to our sinful nature and we want to do our own thing and glorify ourselves and we want to go ahead and rob God of his glory but our express intended design purpose was to glorify him as basically everything else that he's created does so um, manifesting God manifesting his glory is what we are intended to be vehicles of uh, and we rob we rob God of that uh, when one we don't ask. But the hypocrites here, it says that uh, they do so standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Now I know this seems kind of silly, but like we can pray anywhere, so why would that be a big deal? Because they're seeking the praise of the people. Yeah, and it, it isn't really necessary though. How would that affect, how would that move, I guess, God to go ahead and want to respond and to answer? It doesn't. So it's pointless. Um, he says, verily they have their reward. Go ahead. I think probably we would be <clears throat> less direct in our prayer if people were listening too. If you're struggling with, for, for instance, with spiritual victory in a matter, maybe you wouldn't pray that in the street corner. God help me with this sin in my life. Or, you know, and so it, the, the very asking God for things that really you don't need is hypocritical in and of itself. You know, so there's an aspect there to it as well. Sort of here. Yeah. So you're not gonna tell people what your problems are. You're gonna pray pray your strengths, quote, if you will. You know, God thank you that I'm so good at this. I pray that you continue to enable me to, you know, do thus and so rather than God I need your help. I'm insufficient in every way in this area. So. Yes? Uh, I think it's important just to be sure 
Mark lived that. And if we preach something selfishly, God can fix you with that. Not many times I've preached something, I said, oh, that's, that's selfish. And then I pray what I should. He's going to address that, some of that, in his pattern here. Um, but in God's, God's, I guess God's prescription here, he gives command. Don't do so in public, or, no, excuse me. <laughs> Don't do so with the motive of being deceived by men. Um, <coughs> reason why is because, one, it robs God of his glory, and then two, you're not going to get, you're not going to get your answer to, by that means. In other words, he said they have their reward, which they wanted to be seen, they wanted the attention, they wanted people to think of them higher than what they were. So they weren't really actually asking or seeking God for something. So they got <laughs> they got what they were seeking in that regard, but they didn't get from God a response. All right, so God, God actually wants to respond. God actually wants to go ahead and actually attend to what you're asking um, is the idea here. But here's what he gives in contrast is what we should do. Um, it says in verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. Right? So, he gives prior, private prayer uh, as his prescription. Petition God privately, see that because he says enter into thy closet shut thy door and then pray to thy father in secret and then he says a public reward is promised right. when I pray when I ask God for something um, one it's very assuring also when I get the response but two it's also really neat to see that I could go off somewhere um, now I don't know that even in it literally have to go into a, like a physical closet um, but you go somewhere where you're not going to be attended to by another person in other words you're, you're going to be in private it's going to be you and God alone and you come before him you give the request of what you need and he promises that he's, he's going to reward openly he's capable of it and then two that he will one because that glorifies him that demonstrates not just to you, it assures your heart, it encourages you, and it strengthens you that, wow, okay, I can trust God for this, but I can trust God for any number of things <clears throat> that you would come to Him for. And then two, um, when you were to give thanksgiving and praise for that to other folks, it would strengthen and encourage them to be able to go to God. God has now attended to, He has responded to what I have asked. Um, and again, he's not like some magic genie or my little do boy, but the fact is he promises, he gives here, that if I come to him, I come to him in private, that he is going to reward me openly. Now, yes? Can we take like a three minute backtrack? Because I'm kind of I'm kind of coinciding with what Mrs. Dollins said, because it's what I was taught kind of as well. I went to, uh, when I was in college, um, I don't know if it was just some cool type of rubric or whatever, but I always thought that there was four different types of prayer. You know, you have your request giving, the pregatory, and then you have prayers of worship and prayers of thanksgiving. And so, are we saying that worship and thanksgiving are separate from prayer in itself? Um, because prayer, you're saying, uh, and what pastors all saying is that it's strictly asking. Um, yeah, that's or what to they're... ask. That's that's the word we derive from. But so it would not be prayer if your prayer was just full of giving God glory or praise or thanks. Uh, um, that's worship. Sure. So it is separate. So you're saying that worship and thanksgiving is separate. You can include that. Like in other words, I know this seems silly. I'm not trying to be like. Um, I don't know, whatever, OCD about it, but the fact yeah. is it's, <laughs> when you, <laughs> I never really had anybody sit down to tell me, okay, here's what you do. All I did was, yeah. I kind of had to learn by observation, right. and then I would, 
a mental note of whenever, like when I was in church when I was first saved, as far as, I guess everybody's going to okay, just learn how to pray or it would be natural or whatever. Sure. So. Well, you know, it's really interesting along with that question. You went to the men's conference or the men's prayer when we went to that prayer conference in Alabama that one time. Were you there? Yes. Remember we went to the prayer conference and literally you have all these preachers preaching on prayer and mostly what they preach was just Calvinism. But like the person that headed up the conference came to me halfway through and they said, hey, Pastor, what do you think about the conference so far? I said, well, I really like to hear somebody define prayer. You know, I'd say, teach, you know, you're going to go to a prayer conference and the result is we're going to be able to call on God and see Him do great mighty things. You know, and we want to be able to have planted into us the vision and understand that. And sadly, his answer to me was, well, basically kind of like, well, everybody knows what prayer is. And then he said, you know, it's basically like talking to God. You know, well, God's not necessarily lonely. You know, we, we have the poem, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. <laughs> you know, I've always, it's always bothered me. You know, God's just waiting in heaven, hoping one of us will speak to him. You know, that's really a condescending mindset, actually. The fact of the matter is, is that the, the very reason that we're able to pray is because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And he said, Hitherto ye ask nothing in my name, but ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. I mean, literally, ask the Father in my name. We're, it's, prayer is a grand privilege, it's commanded. But it's asking God to do something. It's not, hey God, I'm here. I just want to let you know I made time. You know, another another thing that frustrates me is the word devotions. Uh, because if you think about it, when people talk about doing their devotions, most of the time, have you spent time with God? Almost like he's a puppy dog. You know, you don't look like the dog. You know, make sure you walk him. You know, make sure. And I, I'm sorry, but when you think about it in those terms, you're really diminishing who God is. And what prayer, what God will actually do? It's almost like, well, I, you know, I need to pacify God or appease Him somehow by spending some time with Him, and uh, that—that's why it's important to define the terms. Worship is worship, prayer is prayer, and prayer is literally saying, God, I'm asking you to do something that humanly is impossible, and I am yeah, asking in the name of Jesus. And I, it's, so, it's amazing. It's—it's it's amazing how simple it is. Why we're so powerless. But I believe that the reason we're so powerless, we don't even know what prayer is. We don't even have a concept that God's supernatural and can do amazing things. Because I was always thought prayer is communication. Just yes. as yeah. if it's a yeah. relationship, you know, right. with your wife or yeah. brother or whatever, you know, you're communicating to essentially be on the same page, if you will. And that's what I was that's what I was yeah. I was taught that in college. Yeah, it's communication is communication, you know. Right. I mean, you could be. I mean, when you tell God your needs, you are communicating. Right, right, right. But, hey, how are you? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. In essence, it's almost like you have all these different denominations. They might be all saved people, but people divide them up in denominations so you understand where people are coming from. Well, it's almost the same idea. You know, you got the worship, you got... You know, asking God for something. Technically, it's still prayer. You're communicating. No, we prayer's not communicating. That's what we're saying. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just, narrow you know, you're you're you're, you're kind of separating the different things. To me, as a Christian, it's communicating with God. Because when I pray, what I consider prayer, I might be thanking the Lord for certain things He showed me or He's done. I might be asking questions or help me with something. I'm not going to sit there and say, now let me go the term over worship here. an umbrella term something. that includes a lot of things, but what Charlie's pointing out is that prayer is in, in the Bible is asking. asking. So, you know, when you look at the biblical definition of it, it's asking. Yes, we have this umbrella term that's higher, but it includes more things. They're I think that all prayers communicate, but not all communicate prayer. Yeah. There are elements of other aspects incorporated. And it, yeah. He actually presents a pattern here when he tells us, I guess, whatever the model prayer. Go ahead. My question is uh, to, uh, well, then, then there must be a mixture because 
I mean, when David prayed, a lot of times you see his prayers in the Bible, he would ask God, and then he would reference something that God did, and then he would go back to asking him again. So it seems like the two are intermixed. Both asking and He's providing and a basis for his asking. Well, he's asking it's and then he's praising. Asking. He's like you did before. Thank you but, for doing it yeah, before. But, but asking is asking. But asking. Praising is praising. But if he's putting them together. It sure. says, hallowed so, be thy name. That's you're allowed, to, you're allowed to talk to God when you pray. You know, in other words, Charlie's not saying, well, you know what, you have to close that and then go to worship. That's what right. it sounded yeah. like. It sounds like you have yeah. to worship and then you have to pray. No. It just sounds like... No. It's, what I'm saying is, um, <laughs> you don't have to be OCD about it, but the fact is, <laughs> if you are, if you want to be technical and analyze, prayer is simply asset. All the other elements that are incorporated, all the other elements that are incorporated really constitute, I guess, the umbrella term of worship, because it would be a matter of praising, thanksgiving, acknowledging, you know, God for who he is. And he actually gives, in his, which we're going to look at here, his model of this is what you're supposed to pray like, okay? That the request actually doesn't come until halfway, until you've already acknowledged a number of things first. Um, as a model. And even in Jesus' prayer, um, he has a lot of those elements. And the same thing is with a number of others that we would see that we're going to analyze. David, you mentioned, um, he has, you can even use Hezekiah, even though we don't have his prayer recorded necessarily, the words of what he had actually asked, but we have recorded as far as the fact <laughs> that he asked um, God in tears. And then his life was extended 15, another 15 years after the fact, um, when he was when he was told, "Okay, hey, get your house in order. You're getting ready to die." Um, and then you have others like uh, Jabez's prayer, which was simply a just a request, even though we don't have recorded as far as the actual incident um, of when he actually cried out that. But this was his request, and it was, "God, please, these, you know, enlarge my quarters." You have um, Hannah. You have. Well, mo we, there's a number that we're going to look at, but his uh, here, his. Um, let me just skip down to this, and then we'll go back and address the other stuff that he addresses as far as how the hypocrites pray and how the hypocrite or the heathen do with vain repetition. But here's what he gives us his prescription, his model. I guess you could say, starting in verse nine, it says, "After this manner, therefore, pray ye." All right. So this is how you ask. You want to know how to pray? Now, the reason why I say that is because when you look at Luke's account, Luke's account, um, he says, pray this. And it's, you, you were just read that alone. You'd be like, okay, this is what I have to actually specifically repeat. Uh, but in here, he tells them, okay, this is the manner in which you pray. Um, he starts off, not even with a request. He says, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be, my, or, hallowed be thy name. In thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he, he starts off acknowledging for who God, you know, God who, for who he is, which would be worship or praise. And then, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, this is more of a statement than a request necessarily. Um, but it could be constituted a request. And that is, you want God's will. You want to align your heart to what God's heart is. And this is key and vital. Because the thing is, we're told if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears and we know that we have the petitions that we've asked. So we want when our request uh, to be praying God's will. We want God's will to be done. We want God's design, God's desire. Uh, we know from uh, Psalm 34, uh, Psalm 37 also, that God imputes, we delight ourselves in the Lord, he gives us the desires of our heart. So we want, when we cry out to God, to be asking for something, obviously it would be God's will, so that he can hear us. Um, we also know that um, in James, <laughs> the opposite is that a lot of times when we ask, we ask amiss, that we make consumed upon our lusts, right? And then we don't have answers because of that. Um, even though he also tells us that a lot of times we don't get answered because we don't even ask to begin with. So you should be asking, one, 
but two, you should be aligning your heart to ask for what God would want. And you want God's heart to be um, what is your heart. Does that make sense? I know when you, when you, you're aligning your heart at this point for, 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 for you to pray God's will, for you to ask what God wants. Now we get to the actual request. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, no, actually, technically, the, all the next three are actual requests. Um, but this would be considered, this would constitute the main request. And that is, give us this day our daily bread. All right, so in other words, I need for you to give me what I need today. I need, in this manner, it's the daily bread. I need my food. I need to be fed. And I need it today. I need today's food. Please feed me. And then, this is where you... It seems kind of funny that you would have this after the fact, um, but he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So now, God, forgive me. You're asking forgiveness. You're asking for cleansing because uh, you don't want an obstruction from uh, you to God in, his, uh, in, in order for him to be able to go ahead and bless or answer. We see in... It's in First Peter. Well, it's not just with husband and wife. In particular, I'm thinking of a husband and wife relationship where Peter told us uh, that you're not supposed to, you're supposed to dwell with them, not just according to knowledge, but you're supposed to basically not be in conflict with your spouse so that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, and you don't want no, that's specifically addressing the fact of husband-wife relationship, but we do know that uh, if you have uh, against your brother, as you told the disciples, that when you come to the altar, leave your gift at the altar and then go take care of the issue that you have with your brother. That way you can worship God with a clean heart. In other words, you want <coughs> to be able to come before God lifting up holy hands Know, without wrath and doubting. You don't want an issue between you and God. So if you have anything that would be a barrier, a sin that would be in conflict with His will or causing barrier um, for Him to be able to answer, you need to resolve that. So you seek forgiveness and it says, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Or literally from the evil one. So you're asking God particularly for your provision, um, forgiveness, but then also here He says for direction. You're asking for protection. You're asking him for uh, basically to guide you and keep you in his path and keep Satan removed or keep obstacle from what, in particular, here the evil one, which is Satan. You're asking for Satan to be restrained so that you would be able to go ahead and carry out and fulfill his will. All right. Any questions with regard to that? We see that initially when he started, he starts off, which was not anything in particular to request. All right? He says that, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right? So those aren't requests in particular. Everything else following that is an actual request. But previous to that, when he started off, okay, so this is the manner in which you come. Go ahead. Well, I mean... We're, we're told if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And I mean, that, that is an aspect of element of prayer. It's not my will but thine. Jesus prayed that when he prayed the Father. And so, yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, it wouldn't miss, that would be the request. And that's, you're asking God to align your will with his. You know, God, help my will. Be. Yeah, because you don't want, the thing is, you don't really want to ask a miss. We know that our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Right. And so the thing is, it's easy to go ahead and, especially if you're more of an emotional nature, to go ahead and get yourself convinced that, oh, this is right, this is God's will for me. But Have you ever had somebody rebuke something? Like a, a lot of charismatics sometimes, you tell them, uh, this is going on. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You know, maybe it's a sickness, maybe somebody's sick. And right away they, they start rebuking it. But what if the sick? What if God wanted me to be sick? What, what if it was to the glory of God for me to have a sickness? Or what if you know if that, those things? So the question is, should I rebuke 
you know, should I rebuke or should I know God's will? In other words, the first question ought to be, God, I need to know what to pray about this sickness. You know, I'm going to ask you to do something amazing if it, if I if it's your will to heal me. But God, you know, show me your will because I'll be honest with you, there are some things that people have found out in the, that God is doing that had they, you know, had they not found out what God was doing, you know, they would have never known as a good thing. And so we need God's will. We need to ask for God's will. We need our will. That's what we're asking. God, give my make my will yours. What yeah. yours is. We're actually going to look at that a little bit later. Not today, but we're going to look at that. We're going to look at Second Corinthians where Paul talks about praying thrice for being relieved of his thorn in the flesh. And then we're also going to actually look at John 11, which you would think, okay, how does that even fall into prayer? Uh, and that is where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Um, there actually was a prayer that was made there, uh, which is, I'm going off the definition of request, which is a prayer, which is asking, which was that, uh, and it's going to kill that lesson, but <laughs> quick synopsis. Mary and Martha sent to Jesus, saying, the one whom thou lovest is sick. Okay? He specifically stated this sickness is not at the death, even though he did physically die and he was dead for four days before he went over to attend to him and to raise him up. And then uh, he specifically stated, though, not just that it wasn't unto death, but it was supposed to be for the glory of God. So at times there's delay in answer to prayer. And we'll see that also with Daniel's prayer that as he was speaking it, the angel uh, told Daniel that the request was going to be attended to, but they, was, they were hindered thereby by, basically by, by Satan uh, and his request. So there are hindrances uh, that are not of our doing, and then there are times where God either what would seem as a delay to us, or uh, I guess inappropriate response, or just basically God says, I have something different in mind. And then that is for his glory, where he, as with Paul, says, okay, you know, my grace is sufficient for thee, is what he told him. Uh, with John, uh, excuse me, with Lazarus, it is that, well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. We'll see that. But he does, there are times where it seems, okay, well, he didn't really answer. But it's for God's glory that he does. But his prescription here, we see that these elements are, and then we didn't look at this, but verse 7 says, uh, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Okay, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of because, uh, before ye ask him. All right. So vain repetitions are discouraged, and now here's why. It's the pattern of the God ignorant, okay, as the heathen do. Uh, it seems kind of silly, but what's the big deal about that? If somebody's ignorant about God. You know, why would you expect them to know how to pray? Right. He's talking to his disciples, okay, and he's, which in particular here they're Jews, okay, so they should know God. So he says, "Be not like unto them." If you're born again here this morning, okay, you're God's child. You're God's person. God, uh, now it is our responsibility as a church, obviously, to educate people on this. So it's part of the reason for this series uh, on how to pray, and not just also how to pray, but also what to pray. Um, but if anybody should know God and should know about God and then His will and asking Him, it should be us. All right, so... The heathen, it says, they think that they're going to be heard for their much speaking. All right. Now, he distinguishes here the heathen from God's people in that God's people should know better that God doesn't just hear you because you're constantly repeating or you're using some kind of like formula or some kind of method. But rather, he says... Um, he knows, your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Okay. So in other words, that begs the question. <laughs> if he has, if he knows what I, 
you know, have need of before I even ask them, like, why do I even ask to begin with? I mean, logically, why? I mean, he should already go ahead and attend to me, right? Or again, I guess it goes to the root uh, or main cause, which is that I'm here to glorify God and it glorifies God. It strengthens me and then it glorifies God. Go to Hebrews. Go to Hebrews. We're going to be quickly 11.6 and then we're going to turn to chapter 13 after that. Okay? Well, we'll start Hebrews 11.6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. Uh, for he that cometh God must believe that he is and he uh, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right. In my walk with God, in my uh, however long a time I'm going to have here, we're told that we're to live by faith and not by sight. We're commanded, actually, in not just all the prison epistles, but pretty much almost every book in the New Testament, uh, whether either it's a direct command or there's an explanation of the fact that as a Christian, uh, as ye that have therefore received Christ, so walk ye in him. How did I receive him? I received him by faith. So that's how I'm supposed to grow. That's how I'm supposed to continue. I'm supposed to continue walking by faith. Um, Galatians 2.20, but I just slipped down my mind. Um, I can't think of uh, Second, uh, Second Corinthians 5.20. But we're, we're to walk by faith and an element of faith is that it's not by sight. Okay, we're told here basic definitions, substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And so when I walk with God and when I come to God, it is by means of the fact that He gives promise and I'm resting on promise even though I wouldn't have evidence beyond the fact of His words. And the assurance or the conviction that I have in my heart of the fact that God is actually going to follow through and fulfill what He said He would do is based on one, His ability to back up what He says and two, his actual words, his actual promise. Okay, and that is pleasing to God. That's how I please God, is coming to him by faith. Go to Hebrews 13. Now, there's a reason I give that as a foundation. Hebrews 13, uh, starting at verse 5. He says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Right? This is, I guess, key or foundational to prayer. Um, it's key and foundational to a number of, as number of aspects of the Christian life, but in particular to prayer. I have need. One, because I am needy. Obviously, I'm not self-sufficient. I'm not God. Two, I have need, uh, obviously, because of our sinful state. And that, that's what precipitated our need to begin with. Uh, but I have need and I have lack. And I have, um, I'm put in a position where I'm constantly having to ask God for everything, literally daily. And we're, we'll see later that we're commanded to, that we're to pray without ceasing. That's some of, some of the stuff that we're going to look at later. But I have need because God wants to work on my behalf to demonstrate himself mighty for me. And not just for me, but for all his children. He says here, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. In other words, I have need and I have need to ask God. And I ask God for things so that he can use my life as a testimony, as a trophy of not only his graciousness and his goodness, but as a demonstration of the fact that even though no one can actually logically, uh, rationally, or, or uh, deny his existence, but you can have overwhelming evidence of the fact that he's real. Why do I know he's real? I mean, besides the fact that, yeah, he lives in my heart, you got to answer prayer. I got answers to prayer. God answers prayer to show himself mighty, to demonstrate 
basically to the world, look, he's real. I mean, you already have the evidence of creation, you already have uh, testimony of the Holy Spirit working in a person's heart. But additional to that, there's nobody who be able to stand before God and point their finger at him and said, like uh, Richard Dawkins or some of these other people that <coughs> mock God and sworn God, that, why didn't you tell me that, you know, you really existed? Um, or, you know, if God was really real, then they give some kind of dumb hypothetical. Um, but he does so, or we, we're put in this position as far as needing to ask is because he wants to show himself money, he wants to demonstrate who he is. And him doing that in our lives works his greater plan of wanting to reach everyone. Now, not everyone's going to be reached, and that's for a number of reasons, but in particular because there are a lot of men that are sinful, that are willful uh, rebels that don't want to have anything to do with God. Even if you've seen that in Revelation as far as when they have God physically um, showing his hand of judgment to them, that they would still rebel. And then we would see later on after Satan's been cast into the lake of fire that there are uh, beasts and false prophets are involved in his pit, that, of course you know, uh, beast, uh, Satan's cast in the uh, bottomless pit, it's uh, Satan, um, um, beast and false prophet by the lake of fire, and then you have the season of a thousand years where Jesus reigns, and after the fact that you still have people that would rebel, even after having lived under Jesus' rule. Um, but God puts us in a position where we are needy, or we find ourselves in a position where we are needy, so that God can demonstrate himself mighty in our behalf, and he wants to answer our requests. All right. So, we need to pray, one, yes, we are commanded, two, um, we're needy, and then three, it's going to glorify God. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, next week, we're going to look at uh, a few of, we're going we're gonna to look at James chapter 5 in particular, and then uh, <laughs> James chapter 5 in particular is what we're going to look at as far as uh, uh, prayer, and then James chapter 4. Right. So if not, we're uh, dismissed. <clears throat>